Well, what we have this week is some um, lilac that's seen better days. <laughs> uh, let's see you turn that on the lathe and not have it go flying everywhere. So this is actually probably the largest piece of lilac I've ever seen. Uh, the great thing about lilac when you first cut it is that it's purple in color. So what I thought that we would do is use some crystal purple as the resin or the epoxy to combine these pieces together. And I have struggled with coming up with an idea for this. And I'm going to try and work in some pure white, but we'll have to see how that goes because I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do with that and when. Uh, so I've had this a while and I think the solution to this is to just cut it into thirds and then we'll cast it in in a casting bucket and I don't know I might make maybe a lidded dish of some sort uh, we might be able to take the core out and do something with that I don't really know at this point this piece itself is just shy of 20 inches or so so you know we'll cut it into thirds and then uh, get it cleaned up and then we'll go from there Welcome everyone, uh, getting right into this, uh, cutting round stuff on a bandsaw can be quite dangerous. I've got a really good grip on this so it isn't going to twist forward, but uh, if you're going to cut things on a that are round on a bandsaw, they certainly can be very dangerous. The other thing that we're going to need to do is strip off this bark prior to casting because uh, of course it's not good to stick casting resin to bark, sometimes it's necessary. But if you can strip it off, and it come off quite easily on this, so I didn't have an issue there. And the other thing is, in order to get these in the bucket, I need to trim a little bit of the fat away. So that's what I'm doing here. I don't want to put a weight on the top of this because it will affect our, um, our final look that we're going for. So that's why I'm using the hot melt glue. And one of the little wood sections in the center is loose, so I'm going to use some Star Bond Thin to secure that in place so it doesn't float either. There, I'll tilt that up a little bit, that way you can see better. Should have done that long ago. Good. So what I want to put in here now uh, to take up the space around the outside is some pine cone. And these are white pine and they're off my property. Pine cone again? <laughs> I actually really like the look of pine cone. And I think that they make great fillers. And uh, so when the pigment sits on the top of them, when you're looking straight down on them, they'll look like flowers. And from the side, they'll look kind of like fish skeletons. So it's a, it's a really neat look. And I really like using them. As you just seen, we're going to be using deep casting epoxy from Designer Epoxy. This is going to be a very deep pour. And of course, along with that, we're going to be using the Crystal Purple, a fan favorite, I might add. That and um, the Blue Laguna are probably the two number one pigments that um, people request here on this channel. So we'll get this mixed up and get our first pour in and we'll go from there. Pretty stuff. All right, this will be at least uh, one of three, maybe more. Yeah. I'll bring it back when I've got the next one ready. This will bring it to three liters. Yes, sir. Definitely another one. This will bring it to four and a half liters. Oh man. I'm going to give it another one. I know that that is going to eat up a lot of resin. And this will bring it to six liters.
I wanted to mix this white up so it would start curing overnight. Uh, it should be fine until tomorrow before we see if we can do a, you know, a, an addition to the pour that we already did here. Uh, okay, let's get this piece in the fridge. All right, we'll check on this tomorrow and see what it looked like. What's well, a cold one. All right, so it is the next day and I just pulled this out of the fridge and it is considerably thicker now than it was before. But, you know, I think that's mostly because, uh, you know, this epoxy needs 70 to 75 degrees for it to cure. And with it being in the fridge, that really slows that cure down. So that's the whole idea behind this. We want to slow the cure down, and then that way, hopefully, uh, we're not going to get any thermal cracking. I'm not looking for that this time around, but uh, it is definitely thicker. So that this was in the fridge. This was just sitting on the bench, and it is a lot thicker, and it's actually warm. So. You know, what I think I'm going to do right now, um, I'm going to try and drizzle this in there and then push it down inside of the casting. And then um, I think I might throw it back in the fridge for one more day and then put it in the pressure pot after that. I should mention that this is a commission piece for Janet and she's the one that wanted the purple in here, but I think purple is a perfect match. Uh, especially since this is a piece of lilac and um, she also wanted the white in there and really the only way to achieve that with deep cast is to wait a certain amount of time and in this case for the white it was sitting just on the bench in my clean room for 14 hours and it got to that thickness where it was we were able to keep that color separation all right that's it i'm not going to fool with it anymore stop yelling at your tvs all right, I just pulled this out of the fridge after the second day. I don't see the white anymore. There might be hints of it here and there throughout the casting. Uh, it is, it's not cured yet, but it's well on its way. Uh, the one thing that I do find interesting though is, well, I didn't see this before, but you know, all of a sudden there's all these kind of floaty bits happening. And, I just find that strange that all of a sudden they're they're in the casting, but they all seem to be around the top outer edge, so it's not really that big of a deal. But uh, I don't know. I just thought that was kind of weird. So anyway, I think this is safe to put into the pressure pot. So that's exactly what I'll do, and I'm hoping that it's only going to be a couple of days and we'll be able to get this on the lathe. So you know, if if this doesn't thermal crack. This is a seven and a quarter inch deep pour. So it really, all you left, all you lost was an extra day in reality if it does cure up in two days in the pressure pot. So anyway, we'll see what it looks like after two days and we'll go from there. Well, here we are two days later. Um, it's not a hundred percent done, but might be enough to get on the lathe. We'll have to see. Uh, I do see some bits of white down in here, so maybe the white did take. Working up a sweat here. Man. Well, it might go now that I've got a little channel for this to go down into. All 
Well, Meredith will be happy. There. It just needed a firmer surface. I haven't had like one of those in a while. <laughs> I think it's hard enough to work. You know, I forgot about gluing these in here, so that's probably what held that so hard. Uh, a little surprised to see that we didn't need more resin than this. I'll be honest with you right there. I thought for sure that it would need more, but I guess it didn't. So we'll have to remove some of that. But the good news is no thermal cracking, and this bad boy is... seven and a quarter inches deep so if you're looking to do a deep cast and you don't want any thermal cracking with designer epoxy anyway the fridge is your friend all right let's get some centers and get this on the lathe All right, so it is actually the next day. Uh, you know, when I brought it over to the lathe yesterday, I stuck my fingers in it, or my fingernails, and I just, you know, it wasn't cured up enough for me. So I'm a little head on the video, so I figured, okay, I'll let it sit another day, and I'm glad I did. Uh, but I thought this might be interesting to uh, a lot of people. This piece is 22.2 pounds, and that is just a little over 10 kilograms in weight. So that is a pretty hefty casting. So today, we will certainly get it on the lathe. That's next. That'll do. So we're gonna be starting off with the number three Hercules here from Hunter Tool Systems. And like it always is, we'll strip off all this excess epoxy, stand back and look at it and figure out exactly what we're going to do with this. And at this point, I had an idea that I wanted to make a, a lidded container of some sort. So that's that was definitely when I cast this piece, that was in the back of my mind. And one of the reasons why, or it's not one of the reasons, the reason why I didn't put a weight on the top of that it was, is because I was able to incorporate the little knob on the top of the largest vessel. And I wouldn't be able to keep that little integral knob on the top if there had been a weight placed on it because it would have been sitting directly on the wood. Uh, it's always a risk and when you glue these pieces in, in these buckets, there's always a risk that one may work free and then kind of pop up and, and ruin your design. So that's why when I'm putting these pieces in, I don't spare any of the hot melt glue out of the gun. I really give it a lot. And then uh, it makes it a little more difficult to get out of the buckets, yes. But I'd sooner have a fight getting it out of the bucket than have a piece actually come loose and float to the surface and essentially ruin your design. Or, you know, if that had to happen, then we would have to take easily an inch, maybe more than that, off the overall height of this piece. So that's our first real kind of look at it. And I'm like, you know, I was a little hesitant going into this if it was going to work out and give us a really cool looking piece. And then first time I turned the light off and I kind of looked at it, I'm like, all right, yeah, this is going to work out. And it's actually maybe going to work out better than I had hoped. Um, I'll certainly be looking for a lot more wood with the centers gone out of them, especially if they have multiple layers like this piece did, because it gives you a really... Um, really neat visual look but it is 100 percent 70s you know like it's it just screams 70s to me but uh anyway it's um it's a really cool piece and the core that come out of it is really cool as well need to expose more of the wood um the ghosting up near the rim i'm not a fan of and you know you, when you cast round pieces like this multiple pieces in, into a bucket then of course you're gonna certainly end up with with some pieces some ghosting if you will but you know the 
at that point, the resin to wood ratio was way too much. So I decided to whittle some of that away. So here's one of these uh, zoomed out views for, for you to get a look at. And uh, I'm actually saving those shavings. And believe it or not, those shavings will be in next week's project. And um, <laughs> that just gives you all a perspective of basically what wood turners see when you're turning resin. While it's just mainly resin, when you get down to wooden resin, then of course it all breaks up and it's fine. Uh, but anyway, when we get the, a look at the top of this, you're going to see what I mean by it's a 100% a 70s vibe because it, it certainly was to me. Here I'm turning a tenon, that way we can reverse this piece and get a glue block on the bottom of it, like I usually do. And of course, uh, if you've seen from the thumbnail, that tenon will turn into the knob that's on the larger uh, outside lidded bowl. Some of you may have noticed that there was a ceiling mount when I walked into the workshop. And what that ceiling mount is for is for a new electric heater. Not that I want to have electric heat in my workshop because I believe that we still have the highest hydro rate rates here in North America. But my insurance company would no longer insure me with the wood stove in my workshop. So that had to come out. And along with that, they forced me to move my fridge kilns. Now there, that is just very cool. I absolutely love it. So they see the fridge kilns. The fridge kilns are not CSA approved. And uh, even though it's just a light bulb source for heat, uh, anyway, those had to be removed as well in my workshop. Uh, so anyway, that will open up more floor space. So that's a bonus. Uh, very disappointed that I'm not going to be able to use my wood scraps for heat in my workshop anyway. We can still use them in the house. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're in the area <laughs> and you need a wood stove, I've got one for sale. Just a little bit of sanding here with a 60 grit prior to the glue block going on the bottom of this piece. So once that glue hardens up, we'll be able to trim the tenon away and make it the proper size to fit into the jaws anyway. And I'm using the Ellsworth gouge to do that. And along with that, you'll also see me use the parting tool from Crown. Uh, Crown makes fantastic tools. They also make the Ellsworth gouge. Uh, a lot of fantastic tool uh, makers out there and Crown is certainly one of the better ones that I've used as well as Hunter Tools. So the lid essentially needed a very large tenon on the bottom side of it. So I cut in first with the parting tool so that we have a little lip there to work with. And then of course, plunge this in as far as you can, but after a while you lose mechanical advantage and then it becomes um, kind of sketchy because I've actually done this method and the parting tool actually got ripped 
out of my hands and flipped forward or upwards. So, you know, you can feel it when it's really starting to get kind of grabby, then it's best to <laughs> move on to bigger and better things like the handsaw. And uh, this was a real bugger to cut. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to get through this thing. It could be the fact that the saw has been through the ringer too. And I don't think that it's overly sharp anymore. I cut a lot of footage out of here too. At least you can see it starting to move now. Well, that was way harder than it should have been. <sighs> Some of you may have noticed that I was out of breath there. And, uh, you know, it's because um, I need more cardio. Or any cardio would probably be a start. Anyway, we're going to trim this down and get it ready for corn. We're all set up and ready for coring. This is the one-way system. You can get all your information and the system from oneway.ca. Uh, this is my number two knife set. We are not going to be able to use tail stock support until I can get this in a little ways. And of course, the Core Pro Cutter from Hunter Tool Systems. Link in the description. You're going to see this thing just eat this resin up. Uh, anyway, let's hope nothing goes bad until we can get tailstock support. And I must say that it is very 70s-ish. Starting off here, things were actually going quite well. Uh, no issues at all. The only real problem is the fact that you're... you're trying to core out end grain and resin and it probably doesn't get any harder than that even burl uh, for those who are curious though the lilacs smelled like birch uh, so if you ever get that species on the lathe you'll, you'll know exactly what what i mean and i typically can identify a lot of species just by the smell of them so anyway the intention is to get this cored out and we'll be able to make something with this box but I was having some issues with it coming loose in the chuck. Yeah, well, that's no good. Well, now, what are we going to do now? All right, so the plan now, uh, I'm committed to this. There's no getting out of it because there's no way to hold it. I could pinch it between centers and turn a, a foot here, but or a, or a tenon, but I, you know, I still think that this is gonna work. So I've scraped off a bunch of glue here and I'm gonna go over and just drip a whole bunch of hot mug glue on here. Then I'll bring it back, drive this home with the tailstock and hopefully we can line things up again and uh, carry on. I don't know. She's not good. So hey, it was worth a shot. I eventually put it on the cold jaws and turned this tenon basically away. A uh, couple of reasons why this failed. Tenon was too small. For, this, for the weight and the size of that casting, the tenon was too small. With that said, if you would have been using a steady rest, or if you would have had tailstock support, it would have been fine. The other thing, the base of the coring rig could have moved more to the left, and that way you would have been able to use tailstock support sooner, right about the time that it probably come off the lathe is when that would have been able to have your tailstock support, and you would have a larger core too. I bet you that won't fall off now. So I'm sure there's a lot of people wondering why I didn't do this in the beginning. And the reason for that is because if you look back through my previous work, I don't like putting large glued on tenons on that because it 
it affects your design. You can you can't make the foot on this this bowl any smaller once that large tenon goes on there. Having a smaller glued on tenon will give you more flexibility as far as the design is concerned on the bottom. So that's why I don't typically put on very large glued on blocks like this. In the end, it doesn't really hurt us all that much. And um, anyway, it works out. All right, well, that set us back a little bit in time, but uh, we got a bigger tenon on there now. So uh, <sighs> fingers crossed this will work. So we didn't really lose much on the size of either one of these pieces because it actually run pretty true. And there you can see how close I was to getting tailstock support. So if the base of that rig was further to the left, uh, this probably wouldn't have happened. Or like I said, if I had used a steady rest to hold the bowl. In the end we get it. Uh, there's no damage to the large outer bowl or the core. So I mean that's typically when these things come off the lathe, that's my first worry is, you know, especially if the casting happens to hit the floor, it's not going to be good. Uh, this has happened to me a number of times over the years and one time I actually bent my knife set pretty bad but one way actually offers a knife straightening service so all you have to do is mail it back to them and then uh, of course for a fee they will straighten it and mail it back to you so if that ever happens to you that's what you can do just mail it back to oneway.ca <sighs> well are you like me and didn't think this was ever going to happen? <laughs> oh, man. I will say, though, that I read really cool patterns. Hollow wood is the best kind of wood, I guess. Just showing that I'm ground down a little flat spot for the live center to sit. And I figure that we'll just use the large outer bowl and reverse it this way and get a flat spot turned on the bottom of it because I do plan on putting a glue block on the bottom of this as well. And I know that I covered this, I think last week, you know, every time you put a tenon on the bottom of a bowl, you, you're gonna take away a quarter of an inch to a half inch in height. So this is another reason to go with glue blocks as opposed to turning tenons on the bottom of your pieces. I should mention that we're using the Phoenix there and then you'll see me come in with the parting tool just to get underneath that little live center. Once that's done, we'll hit it with some 60 grit. I didn't want to tempt fate. If the, that actually, that casting was stuck in there pretty good. And uh, anyway, after they hit it with the 60, we'll come in with a glue block. And again, that's just an off cut from pepper mill production. Whenever that video was, it was a while ago now. That's why it says SM for spalted maple on the bottom of it. Uh, so anyway, we'll trim this down and at least then we've got a good solid <laughs> tenon on this one for its size and we'll be able to take out yet another core. Here I've got it reversed. Uh, before I do anything with the coring rig, I want to make sure that things are running nice and true and hopefully that will cut down on vibration. But before we can do the core, of course, we're going to cut the lid off of this piece. And that's what I'm doing there now. This was a lot easier to do because it was any, wasn't near as thick as the, uh, the mother bowl. Well, that one was a little easier to get off. Smaller area to cut with the saw. Uh, really digging the look of this. Um, I think it's really cool. Anyway, um got kind of put back a little bit because of that piece coming off the lathe and fooling around with that but uh, anyway that's going to do it for day today because i'm beat anyway we'll carry on with this tomorrow see you then first order of business the next day of course is to get this other little core out of here i don't do anything with this but you certainly can use it in something else but it certainly went a lot smoother this time that's for sure and you make a tiny little bowl with it or a lid of some sort. That's the lid off of the core and I just wanted to put a glue block on the bottom of that to ease with first of all cutting in the tenon where it's going to fit down inside of the of the bowl itself and I know that by putting it on there with a glue block that it's on there securely and it's not 
going to go anywhere. And of course, that allows you to put multiple coats of finish on and actually handle the piece. We don't use it like that, <laughs> but um, that's certainly one of the big bonuses of putting glue blocks on the bottom is that you can do multiple coats of finish and not ever have to physically touch your work. And that's why I've got about 25 of those little uh, face plates with, with uh, waste blocks on them. So we're just going to trim this piece up now that it's outboard and based on how beefy this thing is, yeah, I certainly could have probably moved that rig quarter of an inch or so, three eighths of an inch, and we still might have been all right. Uh, it's just my, my brain tells me to go for the for sure thing. And then if there's, of course, anything that comes out of this piece, like for instance, the cores, then of course those are a bonus. So, you know, if you if you make your outside bowl too thin and you're like me where you have to switch it to the outside or or if it happens to come off the lathe and, you know, you can't get it true up again, then your, your project maybe or your bowl may be too thin. So that's why I always err on the side of thickness over uh, trying to get more cores out of a piece like this. So this is one of those zoomed out views again. Uh, give you an idea. How I'm holding the tool uh, again like I said last week it's a lot of arm work when you're working on the inside and not so much body work since the outside profile of this piece didn't match the coring rig which it really does for me some people do turn the bowls like that but I'm not one of them so we got to do remove a lot of material in the belly of the bowl and the way that I set the rig up prior to taking out these dry um, pieces out of th these castings is that I leave the bowl out of the chuck. I s put the knife set in that I want to use and swing it in front of the chuck. And what I'm shooting for is about a half inch of thickness left in the base. I would not go any thinner than that because if you happen to get some chip out, then you're not going to have any material to turn away to get rid of that. But that's typically how I set the base of the coring rig when I first start doing these dry castings. Of course, when I'm, when I'm roughing out, I want to leave a minimum of an inch thickness in the base of these bowls. That way you've got enough to turn away after the bowl is dry and is warped and twisted and so on. Okay, so before we take our last few cuts here, uh, there's a ton of little voids and cracks that probably should be filled. There's no probably they need to be filled. Uh, this one here is the worst one and we'll use some UV epoxy for that. But for the rest of them, we're gonna use the Sterbond Thin. So I'm just gonna go around, hit it all these little areas that I don't think that the uh, UV resin will go into and then um, cure it up with the accelerator. Looking at the bowl from this perspective, it almost could have been a Halloween project with a spooky face. So this could have been a lot of things, <laughs> but uh, maybe I should have saved this until uh, Halloween. Oh, well, we'll have to go out with something else. This piece here has actually got quite a bit of dry rot in it. So the, glue's a, the glue is a good choice to deal with that. You see it wicking through all the way to the back side. That's good. That means it tells me that it's getting stabilized with the glue. Anyway, I'll just do the rest of this and then I'll bring it back when we're doing the UV resin. All right, so the big ones, like I said, we're going to use the UV resin from Designer Epoxy. Now, I'm going to try and match the tint. I definitely don't want to mix it too strong or else we're going to have issues with the UV light penetrating it. So just lightly tinted with our crystal purple. There, I think that's good. Sorry if it's hard to see, but 
think that's pretty close. Now we got two big holes to fill, this one, and then there's a smaller one right there. And if you haven't seen this before, it is cured with a black light or UV light. So this is pretty, uh, pretty deep and pretty thick. So, you know, I'm going to leave this on here for 10 minutes and then I'll roll it over and fill that other little hole. Uh, there's no big holes to fill on the backside. I'll have a look at all of these other ones and fill them as well. I might even hit them with the CA glue as well. And uh, we'll see you back on the lathe. So in total, I think I did around three fillings of the CA glue uh, on this bowl and one with the UV resin. Uh, just full of cracks further down into the piece. And, you know, you, you put the CA glue on there and it looks good. And then if you trim away too much of it, sometimes it doesn't get all the way down into the crack. So then you have to fill it again or you'll turn down past something and you'll expose another crack, which happens more than you may think or avoid. So, you know, at times it can be very frustrating, <laughs> but uh, in the end, uh, the results are certainly worth it. Finally, on to sanding, these are the three and a half inch dipple disks from sandpaper.ca. Uh, with this zoomed out look, I thought it would be kind of neat to see how I hold the drill and the amount of dust that comes off of it. And of course, when you sand the inside of the bowl, it really only uses kind of the outer edge of the sandpaper. So the very center part of the sandpaper is still good. So that allows you to sand up the outside of the bowl with essentially almost new sandpaper. And then of course, the next grit, the, rever the, the drill direction is reversed and the lathe direction is reversed. Now that everybody has that mental image burned into their heads, <laughs> we're going to part in the area where the lid is going to be sitting. Uh, I don't put any finish on this because we need to still fit the lid to this. And of course, if you put finish on it, then you're not going to be able to handle it. So that's why I didn't put any finish on it. But I just want to hit this with some 600 to take them sharp edges away. And we will buff this with the Triple E buffing compound and clean it up with the denatured alcohol so that it's ready for its next coat of finish or its first coat of finish when we decide to put that on. Ew. As you can tell, uh, that had a ton of CA glue dumped onto it and there were a couple of spots that needed the UV resin as well. Uh, unfortunately, I had to turn the dust collector on and that may be that little whine that you're hearing just because there was so much fine material in the air that it was actually uh, landing on the camera a lot and it was just really affecting filming. So that's why I had to turn the dust collector on and to be honest with you, if I wasn't filming, it would be on all the time anyway. And just roughly sizing this right now, nothing permanent. There's yet another filling. Uh, again, this piece probably was filled three times, maybe even four times. Uh, the We're going to see me fit this to the bowl. And this time I'm not going to drive it onto the bowl so that we can basically turn the top profile on this piece. Uh, I decided I would use the vacuum chuck to do that. So, you know, I don't care if this is a really tight fit because... Even if it is a tight fit, you're going to have to turn it down afterwards so that it isn't because you won't be able to take the lid off of the bowl. So I figured that I would just use the vacuum chuck to hold the lids. That way we can reverse it and do the very top side of that. Once I got the size I wanted, it was sanded from 60 to 800, just like the bowl was. I don't think I mentioned that. But uh, typically, I don't see the need to go any higher than 800 on these pieces, especially if we're going to use a triple buffing compound to uh, buff it after the 800. All I'm doing there is kind of sizing the rim to the bowl. Not the exact size yet, but 
pretty close to it. And of course we want to buff this and get it, re get it ready for its coat of finish when the time comes. And that's what it looks like. It's a little slack and that's the way I made it. Like I said, I'm going to use the vacuum chuck to hold this piece so that we can turn the top part of it. And I'm using the 8 inch vacuum chuck, which does have a fair bit of uh, pulling force. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to pull this piece off the lathe and that's exactly what you want. But sometimes that comes at a cost and we'll cover that here in a minute. That is again the Phoenix that um, I want to get kind of up underneath of that little knob that I'm turning and the Phoenix is a good choice for that because it's got that small little cutter on it. Definitely lots of white near the knob, something that I didn't see in the beginning at all. Then back to the Hercules and then eventually we'll sand this the same as we did the underside 60 to 800 and then buff it and clean it and get it ready for its coat of finish as well. This is the first coat of Waterlux Gloss. Well, what do you think of that? I think it's really cool. I will definitely be looking for pieces of wood that are shaped like this with the centers gone out of them especially if you can get them where they're kind of in a state of I don't know it's just kind of halfway rotten where you've got some pieces of the center left behind I mean that is so cool pine cones are awesome this piece will certainly be translucent and lots of white I didn't think that the white had made it but there it is there's lots of it in here Very cool. All right, so I'm going to show you what happened here. Um, that 8 inch drum for the vacuum chucking system is will create a ton of vacuum. And uh, everything seemed to be fine. Uh, you know, did, did the other side like I did. And when I went to. Um, take the piece off the lathe, this had dished slightly. But, you know, it's happened to me before in the past and it's, it's now concave like it was originally. And what I did was I just put it back on the vacuum chuck and then sucked it back into its normal spot where it was. But, you know, it's, um, it's one of these things you need to pay close attention to. I was worried about it coming off the lathe but in turn, in a way, almost kind of damaged it. Try not to drop it either, because that wouldn't be good either. And anyway, we'll get a coat of finish on here. But right here, I don't know if the camera's going to get that or not. Anyway, it's divoted in a little bit. The thing is, in order for me to put this back on the lathe and to hold it with the vacuum system, I'd have to decre decrease the pressure on it and I just don't really want to do that because this has actually got a fair bit of weight to it. So what I think I'm going to do is just use my really small vacuum chuck to hold this and I'll put finish on the top and the edge of this here and then um, anyway I'll flip it over tomorrow and do the back side and so on and so on. But anyway if you're using a vacuum chuck make sure that you uh, really pay close attention especially if stuff is getting thin like this and this isn't really all that thin kind of really surprised me I, I, I didn't think that it was going to move that much because there's got to be a good solid five eighths of an inch in thickness but anyway that shows you the power of vacuum and 
And there's the lid. I suspect that this piece is definitely going to take three coats. Um, not a huge fan of the white spot here, but uh, I don't know. This concept I think is really neat and very psychedelic, man. You know what I'm saying? All right, we'll see you tomorrow for the second coat. And what I'm going to do with the other, um, the bowl and the lid is do it tomorrow. This has been uh, eight hours straight. <laughs> so anyway, we'll see you tomorrow. Overnight, I decided that I would trim this back and um, fix it because it was bothering me. So um, I just used the six inch drum this time and I didn't have any issues. That's better. Just couldn't leave it. No textured surface at all. Very little anyway. All right, let's put the second coat on the big bowl. As I normally do, here we're using the Triple E buffing compound between coats of the Waterlux. And then once that's done, we'll be able to clean this up with some denatured alcohol and get the next coat on. All right, this is the second coat of Waterlux gloss. Well, there it is in its second coat. Certainly it's covered a lot better, but I'm sure it's still going to take three coats. A lot of ingrain in this piece, so that's typically hard to get a nice shiny finish on. Pine cones are awesome. Turn this light a bit. So cool. I really dig that for sure. Groovy, man. <laughs> totally 70s vibe. Maybe even 60s. All right, so what I'm going to do for the other one is I'm going to turn it off screen because I am sure that this video is already way too long. And I'll bring you in when I'm uh, doing the finish on the top and on the bottom. There is the core. And I'm going to say it's pretty cool too. I think that this uh, purpley color is a perfect match for this wood. Really dig it. Very groovy. Lid coming up next. There is the lid. Very cool as well. So what I'll do is uh, I'm just going to finish these separately and I'll show the smaller lit container or box, if you will, at the end. Uh, and we'll see you when we're doing the foot on the bowl pieces. Very cool. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but I actually put a glue waste block onto the waste block that was already on the bottom of this piece. Uh, that way, of course, I was able to get it on and off the lathe and, like I said earlier, put finish on it and not get my hands all over it. Uh, the bottoms on both of these bowls were saying it from 60 to 800. I did not buff them as it's kind of hard to write on them after it's been buffed. But just using the Ellsworth gouge to take this down and then I'll switch back to the Hercules and of course sand this up like um, the small one. Anyway, I would like to thank you all for watching this week's video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Please leave a comment down below to be entered into my giveaway at 105,000. Let's finish this video up. All right, well, what do you think about this? Very cool. Uh, better than I anticipated. I will say that. And there's the very top. And there's hardly any texture on it at all now. A little bit, but 
something and that's pretty much unavoidable. Uh, to give you an idea of size, I've got this written down here. I'll put the metric conversion up. It is nine and five eighths across and six inches tall to the top of the knob here. And it's around a half inch in thickness. Uh, hold on a sec. There is the inside of the bowl. Man, I can't believe I'm selling this. I had to, I had to, uh, I had to because she brought it to me. <laughs> she brought me the lilac, so uh, I was pretty much forced to. There's what the bottom looks like. Uh, there's no finish as per normal, I'm running out of time. I didn't want to sign on the resin and these wood and resin combos with the uh, engraver just, I don't think they look good. But I mean, it, I'm really digging this piece. The, uh, the white showed up and it's, <laughs> you'll see it in the rotating footage at the end, but uh, the pine cones have grabbed a lot of it, which is cool. Uh, a real fun project to do. <clears throat> and uh, it does kind of look like a, a ghost face face spooky face so anyway, that is the large bowl the lid has one coat of finish underneath of it as you can see it's quite dry so you know it's going to take probably another two coats of finish underneath of it uh, but again when it lines up with the bowl and I'll make sure to shoot that footage where it lines up really really cool so that is the large one now you can call this a box if you will, small little lidded bowl. I didn't put any, any, nothing to grab on the top here, a knob or a finial. I don't think there's any need to, and it would really, really mess. Here, let me line this up. It would really mess with the way that it looks. So that's why I didn't incorporate any knob or I could have glued something on there or epoxied something on there, but I thought it was best not to do that. There's what I did for the bottom of that. And again, it's got no finish on it either. And there's no finish underneath the lid because I ran out of time for that. By the way, inside the bowl is really, really cool as well. That way, uh, hopefully uh, Janet really enjoys it because I think they're very cool. I should mention that the size on that is, let me see, six and one eighth of an inch across the top and two and three eighths high and it's got about a half inch wall thickness like the large bowl as well and if you're curious about the weight <laughs> it now weighs the two of them together now weighs 6.2 pounds and that is 2.8 kilograms so we've uh we've trimmed away a lot of fat on this one <laughs> that's for sure because i think it was uh 20 pounds right something like that so anyway um Hopefully you enjoyed the video. It was an awesome project to turn. And you got to be really careful with those vacuum chucks because you can, on a solid piece of wood that's that thick, you're not, you don't have to worry about it. So what happened and the reason why that happened is because when you're sanding, of course, you're creating a lot of heat. If I was wet sanding, that wouldn't have happened because I'm sure there'd be some comments about that. And uh, the buffing. The buffing too can create a fair bit of heat for the friction on on top of that so right after sanding and then buffing i think that that's really when it started to really suck in and because the resin got warmed up and more pliable so uh keep that in the back of your mind if you're ever doing something like this don't forget about the deal that designer poxy has on my channel where you'll get five free color bags free shipping within continental usa and canada and uh, on top of that, you also get a 10% discount. So that's uh, designerepoxy.ca and use code inlaygym at checkout and you'll get that fantastic deal. Along with all my other sponsors that are down in the description, sandpaper.ca, Starbond Adhesives, and Hunter Tools, uh, Hunter Tool Systems, all your discount codes are in the description down below. Next week we are gonna be doing, I don't know exactly if it's gonna be a hollow form or if it's gonna be a vase, uh, but we're going to incorporate some of the some of the resin shavings from this along with other shavings that I have because I know that this has been a very very much uh, asked <laughs> video to do so that will be next week so please come on back for that all right 
Take care, stay safe, don't forget the bell. Please share my videos with your friends. That is the largest way for me to build my presence here on YouTube. And uh, we'll see you next week. Take care.